Good morning. Good morning. Very loud. Sorry about that. My name is Vincent. The talk is titled, I know what you did last summer. I'm still hacking your small business. This talk is rated M for mature because at some point I'm going to drop it. Off. <laughs> there will be some things that I'm discussing today that will be considered criminal activity should you not have the permission from your target. Who am I? I'm a penetration tester, I'm a small business owner, and I'm an Air Force veteran. The things that are important to know about me are that I've been in tech for over 30 years. I've been running a tech business for the last 20 years. Started off as a break fix IT company. We were a concierge type business, so small number of clients, high revenue. About 10 years ago, cloud started eating into that model. And what were once six figure clients were becoming low five figure clients. Business didn't scale that way. So I decided to pivot the business, thought security would be a good play, it was a good decision. Um, and took the OSCP course, fell in love with offense, and have been hacking ever since. So what's this talk about? I work primarily with small businesses, so think 1,000 employees or less. Um, you know, we think of big businesses like a Bank of America, you know, they've got a security team, They've got layers and layers of security. They've got a SOC. They run vulnerability scans, pen tests, red team exercises. They got big bags of money to throw at the problem. Small businesses, on the other hand, are the low, fr low hanging fruit. And this talk is about my adventures while working with small businesses. So we're going to target a small business like a malicious actor. Our target is uh, 100 to 250 employees in size. Typically, we find that they're not running EDR, they don't have a SOC, they're not using SOC as a service, uh, they're running traditional antivirus, and uh, they're on flat networks, so no segmentation. So, probably not the only person in this room that has thought about how you would hack somebody and hide your tracks. My wish list consists of uh, burner laptops, going to operate out of a mom and pop coffee shop, because probably don't block the traffic, not worried about their cameras, you know, Starbucks, probably long retention on those cameras, don't want to be on that video. Um, gonna use a privacy VPN, gonna use Tor and Tails, and then I'm gonna get a virtual private server, you know, or two. Some of you may recognize this, it's the logo for Kali Linux. Can't be a hacker unless you use Kali, right? Uh, truth be told, I actually use Ubuntu, and I bring over a small set of tools. Uh, but in the context of this talk, I'm actually going to use Kali Linux because if my operating system gets fingerprinted, I'm going to look like every other script kitty in the world. For my VPN, I'm going to use Mulvat because they take cash, and I think that's hilarious. You uh, send them cash in an envelope, and they say, send us cash, but not too much. But they don't say how much is too much. Uh, so I threw 20 bucks in an envelope, mailed it off to Sweden. And I really expected that to end up in the beer fund, but they're actually like stand-up people. And about a week after, uh, my VPN got lit up. Going to get a little granular. Just want to show you how to get from A to Z. Uh, so we're going to install Tor. We're going to make a modification to proxy chains. And then we're going to curl our IP address before and after. What we see is that we have uh, one IP and then we have another IP. Um, so now we see that we're basically going through Tor. Um, FYI, those aren't real IP addresses because room full of hackers and I don't trust you. Uh, gonna install the Moldvac client, fire it up, connect, same exercise. So before and after, different IP address. So, you know, this is uh, you know, a couple different directions we can go to the internet and basically add some layers of obfuscation. So the question is, are we safe? Is this good offset? Not from a three-letter agency, probably not from even local law enforcement, definitely not from like threat hunters, uh, but from you know a business that's maybe 100 to 250 employees. Yeah, I think we're pretty good. This guy's like, I don't know. So now we're going to go hunting. You might be wanting wanting to know what are we hunting for, and um, we still don't have a VPS. And originally I thought I would get some crypto and I would go to a shady provider and I would get a VPS. Um, then I had this idea. So I fired up a honeypot. And I have a bunch of different ports open on this honeypot. 
And what stood out to me is that almost immediately I was getting hammered with SMB traffic. Uh, so much so that after about 10, 15 minutes, I actually killed it because I figured I had enough traffic. Uh, sorted it out, had 62 unique IP addresses. So here's my thinking. These are bot controlled servers. So probably they were vulnerable and the bots compromised them and then, and then the bots took them over. So I feel like there's probably some vulnerabilities still there, so I can take a position in one of these as well. So I run reverse port scan and I see a lot of public facing services, so I'm sort of liking my odds at this point. So when I'm digging into the traffic, I do a reverse lookup and I see that I've got some that are in the United States, but I've got a lot of them that are actually out of country. And I feel like if I stay out of the United States, I probably am adding another layer of obfuscation so when I dig in further, I find that I have four Russian IPs. So, like, well, IT Army of Ukraine and Anonymous hacking the shit out of Russia. Pretty sure I can blend into that noise and just keep adding layers of obfuscation. So hack the planet, right? I'd like to remind you that that would be considered a criminal activity. So we're going to pretend. So let's say on one of those Russian IPs I find a vulnerable WordPress site. We've got a number of WordPress plugins that I do for various things. And let's say you don't know what a plugin is. Uh, you go to a website, it's got this pretty image and it scrolls and another pretty image takes its place. Uh, that's probably a plugin. Plugins add functionality to the core product. Uh, it would be unusual for there to be a lot of plugins in say a WordPress site. Uh, WordPress backdoor seems a little sus. So we're going to call it WordPress CSS Updater. What we need for a plugin is a few lines of comments so that WordPress actually recognizes that this is a plugin, and then we need some PHP. And that uh, line down at the bottom is just a remote command execution. Uh, so we need to zip it up, and then we get into WordPress, we install it, we activate it, and then there it is, it's sitting in there. Now, I've managed WordPress instances over the years, and never have I gone in and scrutinized the plugins. Uh, that being said, as an attacker, I see that there are two updates available, so I would patch those. And the reason being is, while I've never scrutinized them, I definitely would, as an admin, go over in that section and, and say, oh, well, this needs to be updated, and maybe I would come across this and be like, what is this? So I would patch this so that if an admin comes in, they're none the wiser, and then they go about their thing and I can take my position here. At the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is this. We hit the plugin, we give it the command of ID, and we get back dub, dub, dub data. So we've now got remote command execution on this server. Uh, and we also have ourselves now a Russian C2 command and control server. So I want to talk about phishing. I run phishing campaigns for offense and for defense. And for defense, simulation, education, that kind of thing. Uh, originally, would take one fish, would blast it out to everybody at the same time, and then we pull the metrics. And what we found is that um, you know somebody comes in early, they get fished, and then when other people start coming in, they start warning people, "Don't click that link," uh, and so it kind of skews the metrics. So what we've done is we've uh, taken our users and we break them up into groups. So we have accounting, sales, finance, etc., and then we take fish and we match those groups. Right, so we'll take a fake FedEx email and we'll send it to shipping and we'll send a fake quote and we'll send that to sales and that sort of thing. And then what we do is we break our campaigns and we run them across the entire quarter. And the idea there is we're talking small businesses, so rarely do two people get fished uh, in the same day and rarely do two people see the same fish. So I want to show you some fish. I'm going to talk about variables, uh, percent date, percent time, percent email. If you see these in the fish, just know that they're going to get populated at the time that we send these out. Uh, so upper right hand corner we see percent date. Uh, and so this is your shipment's on the way and it's this $1,699 laptop and the user's like, oh shit, I did not order that. I'm going to click on all these links. This was actually successful. So here's one fake voicemail to email. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the client actually has voicemail to email, except it has their name, the company name, and the VoIP system name. This has none of that. So people click on this all the time. It's crazy. 
bottom of the barrel, it says piece of crap. It says, we received your order, it'll be processed soon. You can view your order by clicking here. It's got a link, thank you, customer service. Doesn't have their name, doesn't have who it came from, doesn't say what they ordered. People click this. The end of the quarter, we pull the metrics and we see that we had 10 users click links and we had two that reported it. I value reporting as much as I value not clicking links. And the reason being, if an actual fish comes into the environment, if they report it, I can purge it from the system. If they don't, other people can click that. So we try to get users into the habit of not only not clicking links, but we get them into the habit of reporting it. This client actually does not care about their phishing exercises. They are doing it for PCI. It is a box checking exercise for them. Uh, this guy says, hey, we're doing our annual PCI security training. Hopefully, they'll pay more attention this year. Went back in my email, found a very similarly worded email from last year. Um, the one thing I would say is if you're uh, above whoever's managing those phishing campaigns, you want to see those metrics. They are above the average. They're at a 20% click rate. Uh, this basically stops at this guy. This C level in this company, they would want to know this. Can't go around them. It's who I report to. All right, so I'm going to talk about spear phishing. Who thinks they can't be fished? Oh, tough crowd. <laughs> so I assume there's people that want to get into security, want to get a job, or want to get a higher paying job. I'm going to stand up a website, Phoenix Recruiters. Whether you need remote or on site staff, we understand the unique challenges of the Phoenix metro area job market. And you're like, we're Vincent. We're not in Phoenix. You're right. I get domains for $12, got this template off of W3 Schools, modified it in about five minutes. Uh, we understand the unique challenges of the Kansas City metro area job market. Could be anyway. Gonna stand out an email. Hi John, I'm Vincent Smith and I work as a senior placement specialist at Phoenix Recruiters, or Kansas City. I saw your profile on LinkedIn and I was really impressed by your experience in computery things. Because computery things are in high demand right now. Here at Phoenix Recruiters, we're always looking to collaborate with talented people who'd like to work with one of our clients. Blah, blah, blah. Sincerely, Vincent Smith. Nice little signature block. Generated that logo on Adobe's website for free. Cost me nothing. And maybe five minutes worth of my time. Nothing malicious about this. I'm going to establish a relationship with you. I'm going to tell you my client loves you. They want to pay you a half a million dollars a year because you, sir, are worth it and it is not real and it's not my money. Eventually, I'm going to get to a point where I say, my client would like to take this to the next level and they need you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That's when I'm going to send you a link or a document and I'm going to get you to do something you don't want to do. So anyone can be fished. All right, felt a little heavy. Got to transition. Everybody meet Jade. Jade meet everybody. Jade's got her CV posted up on this website. When we dig in, we see in her work experience that she's currently working as a bilingual customer service rep at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Prior to that, she was an engineering systems technical sales engineer at Johnson Controls. And prior to that, she was a technical sales engineer at Spirex. She's got an MBA from Pepperdine. She's got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Cal Poly. She's got some skills. Office 365, Salesforce, Visby, and Zoom. She speaks English and Spanish fluently, a little bit of German. John LinkedIn. She real or fake? She's fake. When a person does not exist, that is an AI generated photo. And then because I lack an, an imagination, I got her name, address, and phone number off of the fake name generator. I was demoing this talk for timing with some friends, and the guy's like, well, I would just go to LinkedIn and I would see if she had connections. The same week that I set this up, immediately she had three connections from Thermo Fisher Scientific and one from Pepperdine. She's gonna look real. <laughs> <laughs> to what end, you might ask, why am I doing this? Start my engagement, I'm on my client's website. At the bottom of their page, I see employment. Technical customer service reps needed. Went to the Wayback Internet, saw that this position had been sitting there for a long time. Uh, so I figure it's either high churn or they can't exactly fill that position. Uh, so I pulled it down and I made Jade look exactly like their requirement. At the bottom of their website, they've got an info at company name, 
Outlook.com address. Remember Jade? Jade's got an Outlook.com account. Turns out you can set up an Outlook.com account without a backup uh, email or a phone. Now, two weeks after setting up the account, they said, hey, we want a phone. And I said, no. And they said, we want a backup email. So I went to the disposable email site, generated a fake email, gave it to Outlook. Outlook gave me a six-digit pin. I gave that back. And they said, cool, you were good forever. Now, I'll throw in a caveat since then. You actually cannot do this. I've moved to mail.com, FYI. The idea stays the same. The products may change. Remember Jade's CV site? I embedded a canary token. If you don't know what canary tokens are, they're these little web bugs, and when you click or open or do something, it triggers an incident. So I fire off an email to info at companyname.com. Two of you may concern. I found your job posting for technical customer service rep, and my qualifications are not an exact match. She's not true, she's an exact match. <laughs> However, I'm attempting to secure employment in the Bay Area to be close to my family, and I would appreciate your consideration. Blah, blah, blah. Kind regards, Jay. In the signature block, I've got the CV and LinkedIn. The CV has the web book. LinkedIn's just LinkedIn. It's subtle. I don't know that they're going to click the link to the CV. Spoiler alert, they clicked the link to the CV. Had they not, I would have gone around and around with them like I did with the recruiting website, and eventually I would have got them to click a link or open it up and, and attach it. Um, bottom line, what we're trying to accomplish is this. We had five hits on that CV. Uh, we see the locations. We dig in, we get an incident list. And then when we dig in further, we get an IP address and we get user agent information. When I start an engagement, it's like, I'm on my heels, I'm, I'm uncomfortable because it's like moving into a new house and you get up in the middle of the night and you don't know your way around and you're stumbling. And that's how I feel when I start my engagement. So anything that I can get in advance of that is gonna make me feel a little more at ease. I already know that Windows controls 70% of the operating system market, but I have a Mac, there's probably somebody in this room that's running Linux, I don't know. Uh, in this case, they're all one, running Windows 10, uh, there was a mixture of Firefox, Chrome, and Edge. Um, in this case, with Firefox, I might look up the version and see if there's a vulnerability. Um, so, again, just information that you can get for you know, very little efforts uh, in advance of starting the actual uh, penetration test. All right, calling this multifunction madness. This is Tank. Tank is real, by the way. That's my little buddy, 75 pound pit bull. Got the prey drive of, I don't know what, like scale from one to 10, Tank's like fucking 15. Where's that button? Tank is the kind of dog when you open up the back door, he's got to survey the perimeter. So one day I open up the back door and Tank's doing his thing. Should add that I'm from Arizona, I back up to the desert. We got a lot of desert creatures that roam in and out of our yard. So Tank gets along the back wall, and on the back wall there's this giant lizard. Tank sees the lizard, the lizard sees Tank. The lizard starts running. Tank's in pursuit. Lizard does an about face, this goes back and forth a few times, the lizard falls off the wall, Tank pounces on it, chomps into it, swallows a hole. Most disgusting thing I've ever seen. I know. And I'm like, you sir are a bad dog and you are not coming to the house. <laughs> that was two years ago. Every day since that day, I open up the back door, Tank makes a beeline to that spot on the back wall like the lizard's gonna teleport in for him. It is that kind of persistence, OCD, whatever you wanna call it, I have that with your fucking copiers. <laughs> I love copiers because people do not appreciate what these things are. They're like, what, hackers gonna make free copies? No, they scan to file and they scan to email. So I start an engagement, I get into the copier, and they're scanning into users' home directories. Those home directories are locked, to the re they're restricted to that specific user. So instead of giving that scanner account access to those home directories, they threw the scanner account in the domain admin screen. I took over the scanner account, I am domain admin, came over for you. So in another instance, uh, they were doing scan to email, and I get in and I don't see, there's no credentials. 
So in my head, I think mail relay. And so backstory is they were changing their passwords every 30 days. And so every 30 days, the scan to email function was breaking. So they got this idea that they would whitelist an IP address to allow uh, mail relay. And uh, instead of doing a one-to-one -one mapping from the scanner through the firewall, they just whitelisted the entire network. So I get in, I see this, and I'm like, pop open a terminal, send off a mail that goes through, fish the entire company off of that mail relay, and it was bypassing their security controls. So then I get in this engagement, and I find this Xerox VersaLink. So I'm like, Google, what's the default password? One, 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 one. So I said, right? One, 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 one. Cross my fingers. Upper right hand corner, we're logged in as admin. So a lot of times these are managed by outside parties, and as uh, administrators, they're not like engaging with that. And so outside company wants to leave the default credentials. So we're in this copier. I get over to the mail section, so and scan email, and I see that it has credentials, but I get this idea. I'm gonna point this to my attacking server, and I'm gonna downgrade the port to 25 because 25 is unencrypted. If I were to make scanner software, I would make it so that if you made a change to the settings, that it would make you re-enter the password. I've never found that to be the case. When I start an engagement, I fire up a tool called Responder. Responder is an LLM in our poison. It basically does man-in-the-middle stuff with Microsoft. What I'm hoping is that I cache those credentials from that uh, scanner. So we get in here, we've got my attacking server, we've downgraded the port to 25, we throw in a bogus email, we hit test, and there we go. Clear text credentials coming across on Responder. So when I get on your network, I'm gonna scan for all those copies, because I love them. And if we're counting, we've got 19 of them. I'm gonna go through every single one of them. I'm gonna look and see if you've got scan a file, scan an email, see if there's something there that I can use or abuse. Now in the case of this scanner account, it actually was not a domain admin, but what it did give me the ability to do was map to HR and accounting. So for defining impact, HR, personally identifiable information, finance equals money. In my report, I wrote the penetration tester used tools and techniques to extract data from the network simulating the actions of a malicious attacker. You got ransomware gangs that get in your network, they exfiltrate your data, they encrypt them, and they say, pay us, we're going to take your data, and we're going to dump it all over the internet. That's what I just did. I find it. Next one I'm going to call evil bookmark. I need to give you a little backstory. In my scoping document, I ask, how is the penetration tester obtaining access to the network? Could be over a VPN. If they don't manage the edge and they've got an IDS, I might send them a little Intel Nook, which is a computer about this big. Send it to them, say, hey, drop this in the middle of your network, plug it in, turn it on, it calls back to me, I can get back in and I can do my thing. Or a jump box. So you give me access to your network and then you've got a box provided for me in your network. And that's where this story goes. So I get into my jump box and I realize my box is inserted into the domain and my account is a domain user. And I'm like, that is way more privilege than I thought I was gonna get. But I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna run with it. So I have this idea. This is a bookmark. Little picture, little arrow, right? We see these on our desktop, we see them in, in our browsers. Uh, we look at this at the file system level. It's a file that ends in .url. And when we open it up, we've got this four, these four lines, right? Internet shortcut, points to the resource, bottom line, icon file. That's what is rendering that image, right? TweetDeck had that little bird. Got this pointing to my attacking server. If you recall, we didn't have to do anything to make that TweetDeck bird light up, right? It's the act of opening to that location. So I take this bookmark, because I'm a domain user, I can map to a common company share. I drop this bookmark into that company share. I've still got Responder fired up. Immediately, it starts raining hashes. 
Moments later, I get the administrator account. The administrator. I'm like, what is going on? So I'm doing a post-mortem on this engagement. It turns out there was an administrator using the administrator account as their regular user account. I'm like, shit, you should not be doing. <laughs> All right, calling this tell me your secrets. I start my engagement. I go to Hunter I.O. If you don't know what Hunter I.O. is, it'll give you known email addresses. Sometimes it gives you like their job title. Um, what I'm interested in is the naming format uh, for the email address because most times, if not all times, uh, it's the same as what's going on internally with their domain users. So what we see here is that it's first name dot last initial. So I take the 200 most common first names. I do a little bash scripting and what I'm doing is I'm appending dot A through dot Z to the end of each of those names. So we got Aaron A through O, it goes through Z. I do that with every user. I'm gonna use a tool called Kerbru. As an unauthenticated user, I can spray the domain controller with my list of users and Kerbru will come back and tell me whether that's a valid username or not. So that's a bunch of users there that we've got and that is one half of what I want. The other half is passwords. A few years ago, there was a blog post written by a pen tester. I uh, was talking about commonalities uh, that he found across his engagements, in particular with the help desks. So you go on vacation, you come back, you get locked out of your account, you call the help desk. Um, hey, got locked out of my account. Help desk is wanting to be helpful. It says, uh, we've reset your password with password complexity. Uh, welcome one exclamation point, capital W. Uh, another thing that they're doing is uh, the seasons of the years, so spring, summer, fall, autumn, throw the year at the end of it, exclamation point, right? So we got welcome, autumn, winter, spring. I'm lazy, I bash script everything, so I got welcome, winter, spring, summer, fall, autumn, uh, 2019 through 2022. The reason why I'm going back in the past is uh, a lot of times you find that people will uh, disable account and then open it for a manager and then forget to close it again, or sometimes they just forget to close accounts. So it would be unusual to find, say, a summer 2021 exclamation point. I'm going to go through my client's website. I'm going to see if they're in an industry or if they make a product. Um, I'm going to grab stuff from their address. In this case, I'm going to grab Fremont City. I'm gonna make my list. Uh, welcome, Fremont, autumn, winter, spring. It says lockout proof. I find that nine is a good threshold. I have run into five. Um, typically lockout's like 15 to 30 minutes, so even if I hit that lockout, um, I just come back in and do the rest of my list. So I'm gonna use a tool called Crack Map Exec. I'm gonna spray the domain controller with my list of users and welcome one. We notice status, login failure. Come back in with Fremont 1 and we get a hit, jody.o. Going to use a tool called Hydra. Hydra is a brute forcing tool. Typically you have a username but you don't know the password and you brute force. Um, I actually know the username and password. Um, so what I've got here is a little for loop in the front. I'm spraying hosts 1 through 100 with Jody and Fremont. And I'm looking for a remote desktop. Uh, after COVID, a lot of users have been given remote desktop access to their desktops uh, because they're doing work from home. So uh, see here that uh, connection failed to establish, so we're not getting a hit. Uh, we come over here, dot .62, we get a hit. So we got a valid account on a, on a system with RDP open. So the question is, now what? Bro, pop shells, medicine play, cobalt strike, hack the plant, right? Could. Or we could use ConnectWise control. So if you're not familiar with ConnectWise Control, it's a uh, help desk product. Basically, you call the help desk and you're like, hey, logged into my computer, my icons are all upside down, I don't know what's going on. And the help desk is like, wow, that's really weird. Can I like, jump on your computer and share your screen with you? They're gonna use a tool like ConnectWise Control to do that. Turns out, you can set up a ConnectWise Control account without a credit card and just any old user, so I use Jade. Would point out that if you bounce into somebody's desktop while they're logged in, you're gonna kick them out and that's gonna draw attention. 
So what I'll typically do is I'll figure out what their hours of operation are. Might call into the desk, see if somebody picks up. In this case, I came in in the wee hours of the morning, got on the desktop, install ConnectWise control. See Jody PC show up in my console. Bottom left-hand corner, trial expires in 14 days, which is super convenient for me because that's about the length of my engagements. At the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is this. We execute the command, who am I? And we get back NT authority system. So I don't need Metasploit or Cobalt Strike. I would have to go through you know, evasion techniques. I can just take a legitimate application and I can install it on this desktop and I can accomplish the same thing. I'd like to point out that this dumpster fire was brought to you by local admin. If you give your users local admin to their systems, I'm gonna wreck your shit. So it's enumeration time. There's some offensive PowerShell called PowerSploit. I've never used this in the real world. It gets detected. Uh, but because I'm local admin, I'm gonna harp on that, I can install the remote server admin tools. Legitimate from Microsoft. So I get RSAT installed, and I start enumerating uh, the environment. First thing I'm looking for is password never expires. Now the reason why I'm doing that is I've actually been in the middle of an engagement where I compromise an account and then the password changes in the middle of engagement and I get locked out. So I might hunt for accounts that never expire. Um, and in this case, we've got a couple of them. They look to be service accounts, uh, SVC SQL, SVC 3CX. Um, oftentimes what we find is that people will automatically take service accounts and just dump them into domain admins group. So when we query, we see that uh, Service SQL and Service 3CX are in the domain admins group. Another thing I'll do is I'll hunt for descriptions because sometimes you find things like this where the password is in the description field. So we've got a service account that's in the domain admins group and the password never expires and we have the password. Game over. So, this is really small, I know you can't read it, just kind of pointing out that this is all the native PowerShell that I've written to live off the land. Uh, I could give an entire talk on PowerShell and Active Directory. You can totally live off the land and avoid tools like PowerShell. All right, I want to rewind for a second. So we're on this Jody system, and I query the users, and I see Jody, but I also see this disconnected administrator account. So there's a tool called Mimi Cats, and Mimi Cats has been neutered in recent times, um, and it, we would typically want to dump LSAS. LSAS contains uh, password hashes and clear text credentials. Uh, but because we're local admin, we don't need Mimi Cats to dump LSAS. We can actually right click on it, create a dump file. It dumps in its temp directory. And then Defender pops up and says, whoa, that was a suspicious behavior. And I'm like, oh shit, it's going to delete my file. So I go into the directory, and I immediately zip a copy in place, and I drag a copy to the desktop. Moments after that, Defender actually deletes that file, but leaves the zip copy and leaves the copy on the desktop. So it's the act of dumping LSAS and not the existence of the file. So Defender's almost there, but not quite. And because I'm level 11, I disabled Defender. Now I can take Mimi Cats and I can point it to that dump file, and the first thing that we notice is an administrator account and an NTLM hash. Hold that thought. We get clear text credentials. And then I notice this, what appears to be an Office 365 generated password. So I think, I'm gonna log into Outlook Web Access. So I go to OA, give the username and password, it accepts it, but then it throws up. It gives me this base64, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. So I base64 to code it, and it says the mailbox being accessed doesn't have a valid account state protocol disabled. I'm like, sometimes I have to think about like what's going on, and I think they didn't want to roll out two-factor authentication. So what they did was they disabled Outlook Web Access. But you don't give users a mailbox unless you want them to access mail. Oh, by the way, just say no to security by obscurity. So I'm on Jody's system. I start a new profile, throw in info, a company name, 
throw in the password. When I see this, I know I'm good. You're all set. So I get into the mailbox, and I don't have permission to access this user's mail. What I do notice at the bottom is something that I want to highlight. It's from Raytheon, DOD Cyber Secure Dear Supplier. Uh, I think this is DFARS. Government's tired of getting supply chain hacked. Went to their vendors and said, hey, we got this list of compliance things that you need to, you need to do, and your vendors need to do that as well. So the vendors of vendors need to do this. Now, the thing that's really interesting is having finished this pen test, I know that they're not DFARS compliant. And then the other thing is, look at the date, 2016. Six years they haven't been compliant. All right, so I want to rewind back to the administrator account. Going in for the kill shot. Using crack map exec, I take that administrator account and the password hash, and I spray it to the main controller in the bottom right hand corner, we see pwned. So at this point, I take the Jody account and I throw it into the domain admins group, and at the bottom, we see the command completed successfully. Sanity check, query the domain users, and we see that Jody is in the domain admins group. Fatality. So we've exfiltrated data, we've taken over the mail, we've got a mailbox, domain admin, we win. So at this point, I want to offer some solutions. <laughs> Kidding? Maybe. First thing we need to do is we need to gamify phishing. Users do not give a shit about their work computers. They're like, why do I care if it gets ransomware? Not my stuff. So what we've done was uh, pre-COVID, we were giving out these little glass fish bowls. Uh, you successfully completed a campaign where we were giving out rubber fish. People were actually trying to compete to have more fish in their fishbowl. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, $5 Starbucks gift cards. So you figure a 100 employee company, we run our campaigns across an entire quarter. So $500 a quarter, it's like coffee and pretzels. Pretty cheap. People like getting free coffee. Um, password managers and 2FA. Been beating that dead horse for a long time. Um, you had password managers, unique passwords, you weren't doing password reuse, and you had MFA, you would stop me a lot. Um, antivirus to EDR. EDR stands for Endpoint Detect and Respond. It's fancy antivirus. Um, used to be enterprise expensive, now it's small business inexpensive. So we've moved all of our clients over to EDR at this point. Um, and then see security information event management, to log, log aggregate for all the devices. Um, again, something that is now cost effective for small businesses. Um, in the case of like the things that I was doing where I was like spraying the environment like from one location or spraying a lot of users, things like that, that would have generated an alert. Somebody would have gotten that alert um, and then I would have been detected. Um, so these are things that we're recommending. I'm not here to pick products. If you want to know about some products, grab me offline. I'll talk to you. Uh, with that, say thank you and then uh, throw it out for questions. If you want my contact info, um, grab that because I'm gonna switch over to the sponsor slide here in a second. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry, did you get that? I got that. Right Anybody? Bueller? Oh, sorry, yes sir. Maybe cats would have gotten detected. And I, I mean, you know, and honestly, like I typically wouldn't run Mimi cats on a system, but it, doing it for impact. Because you can, you can take that dump file and you could exfil it to your system and just run it off there. The question was, is the dump file plain text? And it is. No. Thank you.